This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 621, recorded on May 29th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Good afternoon, Vincent, and it's a hot and humid and muggy day out there. Why is it called Fort Lee, by the way? Uh, it was named after a general. Okay. Robert E. Lee? No, no. This was a general in Washington's army. Oh, way before. Way before. Okay. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rich. Uh, we've got a, just a gorgeous day here. It's uh, 85 degrees, partly cloudy, no mosquitoes. I've been uh, sitting out on my uh, back porch, gazing over my garden and cramming for twiv. Cool. All good. Why is it called? Why is it called Austin? Right. Uh, because of Stephen Austin, who was uh, uh, instrumental in the uh, settling of Texas early on. Okay. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here, and it's called Western Massachusetts to distinguish <laughs> it from the area with the high cost of living. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Well, because of it's on the western side, but is it uh, cheaper than the eastern oh, side? Vastly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the Berkshires are not cheap, right? Uh, no. Depends on where you are. There are some very, very nice areas up there and resorts and that kind of thing. But then there's also a lot of just rural hmm. um, area. Uh-huh. Got it. Uh-huh. From southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Ann Arbor is named after the wives of the two founders of the city. Uh-huh. Oh. Ann you mean Ann and Arbor? Ann Arbor. <laughs> Arbor. <laughs> no. uh, and also because of trees. Ah. It's not named after arboviruses? No. Did you make that a question on your exam? <laughs> no. I will, though. The next, the next exam this summer, I'm going to put that on. That's right. That's one of the choices. <laughs> That's very good. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Good to be here. It is 81 and sunny, and I'm pretty sure Madison is named after the former president. Yes. Um, who is a character in Hamilton, as is General Lee, um, uh-huh. who I think is the namesake of Fort Lee. Exactly. You know, there's a Clinton, New Jersey, and yes. during the impeachment hearings, they wanted to change the name of the town. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was named after DeWitt Clinton, however. I would assume it was. Yeah, it was named after. But this is how people think, right? It's true. Some people are COVID idiots. Or that they don't think. What do you think? I forgot to tell you the temperature here. It's 60, which is about 19 Celsius. 60? And, oh. Yeah. It dropped considerably, so I wow. think you have some cool weather coming your way. Wow. I hope Look so. To it. Look forward to it. Speaking of temperature, sometimes in the morning my wife will say, what's the temperature going to be today? <laughs> and I look at my phone, and it's in Celsius, and I tell her, and she gets really mad. <laughs> so I can't – I don't do the <laughs> conversion you keep because – but yeah, but I never learned after. But, but have you taught her the simple conversion of sixteen sixty one twenty eight eighty two? That Does, could make her a little happier. Maybe. But then I have to go to her phone, which has it in Fahrenheit, because I don't convert. Because I want to learn in Celsius how it feels, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you spent your whole life learning in Fahrenheit it's true. how thirty two feels, etc. That's right. And so, you know, I can say yeah, twenty. That's room temperature. I got that. <laughs> uh, I'm retired. I'm not doing that. Well, you got thirty seven. That's that 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 too much effort. Right. You know, I, I avoid things that involve too much effort. <laughs> also joining us from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. How's your week been? Uh, you know, it has been a good week. I got a little time off this weekend just before I went into this uh, 11 day straight stretch that I'm now in the midst of. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's good. It's, um, you know, I I, I'll, I guess I'll be relating all that Um uh, to our listeners, but yeah, it's been it's been good. Also joining us as a guest tonight, he's a member of Parasites Without Borders, of clinical researchers, and was last on TWIP number thirty. Chuck Kanersh, welcome to TWIV. Thank you, Vincent, and hello, Daniel. Well, it's good good to have you here, Chuck. It's uh, <laughs> you know usually when the three of us get together, we've got Dixon in tow, and we're over at uh, Coogan's, which is a local Irish uh, what is it sort of restaurant tavern? Yeah, which is no longer. 
Oh, oh, is it just temporarily or has it? No. Uh, They've announced they're out of business. Oh my gosh! So we can't go there anymore. Oh, that is uh, that was a landmark. That is uh, really a disappointment. That's sad. Yeah, it is too bad. It was good to get together, and I assume there'll be something else. So we'll just have to do that. Yeah. So Daniel, it is time. It's been a week since we last spoke. Time to have uh, a clinical update from you. Okay. Well, um, you know, a lot of clinicians listen to this, but I know a lot of non-clinicians listen as well. So I'll try to, to give a balance here, make sure I don't get too technical. Uh, but I was going to, uh, I've started in my head titling these little clinical updates. And, and this I'm going to call the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hmm. Um, and th- the reason I do that is I always promise that I'm going to give good news. And if I don't give it right up front, I just don't. <laughs> so um, I was I was talking to my mom via phone, right? She's been evacuated after out um, of the city since actually the end of February when I had this crazy idea there might be a pandemic on the horizon and I wanted them safe. Hmm. And, sh- and she was saying, just give me good news. Make it up if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the traditional Irish. I remember my grandmother saying, never let the facts get in the way of a good story, Daniel. <laughs> so um, I will start with some some good news. And I will say that Um, All the shelter in place and all the social distancing and all the social cohorting and the quarantining and and all the many other measures um, that were employed in the New York area were were effective. Um, The numbers are definitely down. Uh, The number of patients in the hospital um, with COVID-19 is is really down. Um, You know, many parts of the country certainly are seeing increases, but um, I could definitely say, um, you know, from a bit of good news, um, we are we are doing well in the New York area. The number of um, deaths are down. Um, So that'll be my initial bit of good news. My second bit of good news um, is that people are starting to look in the New York area at opening up and actually across the country. There's a lot of opening up. that people are doing and looking at doing. Um, this is all state by state variations. Um, and I'm starting to get a lot of questions now from, from clinicians. I sort of put it some information about how do we handle this? Um, how do we handle opening back up? How do we handle people going back to work? Um, and um, a, a couple things I will say is that CDC still has the two tracks. Um, one is the non-test based paradigm and one is the test based paradigm. Um, most of the clinicians got very used to the non-test based paradigm and a lot of this had to do with access to tests. So, you know, if you start saying, oh, everyone needs a test followed by another test 24 hours before they can, you know, leave quarantine and go back to the workplace, um, what was happening uh, is that was really um, creating a problem because how do you access those tests? And the turnaround time was um you know, quite lengthy. It was actually out to about seven to nine days at one point. So very quickly, people got used to a non-test-based paradigm. Initially, it was if you've been sick for more than seven days and you've had three days or more of no symptoms, then good to go. That got a little bit extended out to 10 days. Um, And then um, we started getting this Uh, return to a test-based paradigm. And I think part of this was as we were seeing numbers go down. Um, So now I get a lot of questions. Um, Here's a person, you know, they maybe were never even tested up front, but um, were made, you know, the diagnosis was made clinically. Um, And now the, the employers are starting, and I think this is interesting, the employers are starting to, to request um, that the person have a PCR negative and interesting enough, some employers are starting to request um, serology testing, hmm. which is very interesting. Um, so I, I will comment on what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, in general, the CDC is giving us guidance. That's great. Um, but if the employer is demanding a PCR test um, and basically telling the patient that's required, there is a CDC um, guidance on um, the PCR testing. Um, in the hospital, actually, because of the executive order from Cuomo, um, which we talked a little bit about last time, uh, a lot of the facilities are requiring a negative PCR test before they'll accept people back. Um, hmm. 
so this is creating, I, I'm going to say, um, you know, I listened to, uh, as I mentioned, I listened to the other TWIV episodes once I tune off. It takes me about a week uh, because it's like little snippets when I get a bit of time. Um, but we're running into a bit of resistance as we return to the um, contact tracing paradigm. And this is the the Tetris, um, mm-hmm. so the test, trace, isolate paradigm. And part of it is that people are actually fearful. They're afraid that if they submit for a test, once they mm-hmm. get that one positive test, then a couple things are going to happen. One, now they've entered into the testing paradigm, and it's going to be required that they get a negative test before they can return to work. They're also worried um, – you know, and I had a firsthand conversation with this just recently that the Department of Health will track them down hmm. um, and will actually um, then track down their contacts, will restrict their freedom, will prevent them from going to work, which a lot of people really are desperate to do now. Um, so it's been interesting in that clinicians are starting to hear when a patient calls and they're concerned. Um, they get pushback sometime if uh, they say, oh, this sounds concerning. I think we should get a test. And the patient may say, no, let's not. Uh, because if mm-hmm. you test me and it's positive, I'm worried. Um, and early on, when this first started with healthcare workers, we would have the issue where, you know, you might get a phone call and it was, oh, you've had an exposure. You need to now go home and self-quarantine and not work for 14 days. And people are worried that that's going to happen. And I had one of... Um, one of my colleagues who's an infectious disease doctor, they got a call a few days back, um, you know, doctor so-and-so, preserve their anonymity. Um, you know, you, you, it seems as though you may have had a COVID exposure. Uh, their response jokingly was, really, <laughs> just one. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and there was silence. And then the, this is not a laughing matter. And they're like, okay, oh my gosh. So there was almost sort of this, you know, police type enforcement. And, you know, this, the story here was a person, you know, initially was PCR negative, then was PCR positive. Um, and now, you know, they had had this exposure and there was this concern about, okay, are you going to go back to that paradigm where you're now going to tell this infectious disease doctor that they need to go home for 14 days quarantine? So people are worried hmm. about the the Tetris approach. So this will be interesting and sort of a, um, hopefully we have some Department of Health people listening um, you know, we're, we're going to need a little bit of communication with the public so that this fear doesn't go away. Um, also, we moved away from a testing paradigm um, at the guidance of the CDC and a lot of physicians saying the testing needs to be prioritized. It's limited. Uh, mm. We're starting to see these longer periods of time between the test being taken and the result. Uh, so that also creates an issue, too. Uh, so just... Things are opening up, sort of sliding here into the bad. Um, the next would be the silent spreaders. We're starting to worry about this um, as people are getting tested for surgery. We're starting to realize people without symptoms, quite a number of them are coming up positive. Mm. Um, and so that's beginning to increase and reinforce this message about there are people out there who never have any symptoms, but you test them and they're positive. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing this even in the hospital creates an infection control issue. Here's someone who came in for something else, but the decision is made to send them to a rehab facility. They get a PCR test because that's required. Now it comes back positive. And the whole cool. question is, well, what's going on? Hmm. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. That'll give you uh, an idea of how many people are infected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's. Do, that, you have, do you have any? Do you have any sense of numbers so far? What fraction of people coming in for electives are are positive? You know, the number I heard was it was about uh, ten or fifteen percent of people who we we are just screening are coming back positive. So it's at this low rate. Wow. Um, but, wow. That is a little higher than you would think, right? I mean, it's actually, yeah, it's sort of similar to what they told us was infected so far in the population from some of those early um, yeah, yeah. serology assays. But we're going to get to those because we're going to, in the in the bad and ugly, we're going to get into um, some of the issues with the serology testing. Hmm. Um, an update on the late stage issues. Um, and th- this is where, you know, I always feel like, okay, things are getting better and I'm an optimist for a moment. But then, um, you know, in adults, we're seeing this issue that we brought up several times with really prolonged PCR positivity, um, where if you're trying to get someone um, 
out of the hospital, out of quarantine, we're seeing the PCR staying positive out to two months. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also, as I've discussed, we're continuing to see the late stage symptoms, um, such as the joint pains, muscle pains, um, leg pains. Um, we're seeing this thick mucus. Um, we're seeing prolonged fever. I actually got a call from uh, one of the infectious disease docs who I've coordinated with in the last few months. He's an older gentleman. And so um, I was taking care of his COVID patients in the hospital um, with you know the associated high exposure with that. And then he was doing a bit of outpatient follow-up and telehealth for me. Um, and he was saying, Dad, you know, I, I'm seeing people six, seven, eight weeks. They just keep having these low grade, you know, fevers, 100, 100.8, 100.9. Um, and it's going for six to eight weeks. And I said, yeah, that's what we're seeing too. And um, there was a recent paper where they say people that have mild symptoms, fevers might only last about um, eight days. People who get a little sicker might last about 14 days. But we're, unfortunately, there's a, a nice enough chunk of people here who continue to have a fever for two months. Um which is really a long time. There's also a Mm -hmm. late stage chronic diarrhea that my gastroenterology um, colleagues are seeing. Um, We do all the testing and it just is this chronic late stage diarrhea that we don't quite understand. Um, The other thing, yeah, Chuck. Just to follow, yeah, no, just to follow up question because we've been trading some papers on the subject and, you know, you're at the front lines seeing a lot of these patients. Do you think it'd be worth getting some of these um, later stage people, especially the people with fever, and getting them close to a facility that might have a BSL-3 laboratory and seeing if there's any correlation between the prolonged RNA-PCR and actual presence of virus after you sample various tissue spaces? So I would say yes. You know, this is um, like a perfect um, issue that... So we've seen in a bunch of people... You know, and we just had an issue today, and I'm trying to clarify this, where people seem to have gotten better... And then they get worse again, and um, the you know the PCRs are positive. And um, we had a gentleman who was sick for quite a while. Then he he proved was PCR negative twice. You know, twenty four hours apart was moved out of the intensive care unit. Was in a regular room, um, and now his his white counts coming up. His inflammatory markers are coming up. He's not doing very well. And his roommate uh, just came back PCR positive for COVID, and his roommate came in 10 days before COVID negative. Um, so we're, we're starting to worry about this issue. Um, you know, we, we keep saying there's, there's no second phase. We're hoping people can't be reinfected. Um, but I'm actually quite concerned about, um, you know, we've been using PCR, which uh, I think people on Twib have been really excellent about pointing out. This just tells us that we're detecting genetic material, but still detecting genetic material 55 days after symptom onset with this second peak, which seems to have like a rebound of all the inflammatory markers. And now um, I'm not sure what to make of the exposure here. This, the individual who um, is now COVID PCR positive was on a, a COVID free floor. The, so we think, um, you know, and his roommate was someone that had been negative for PCRs and, you know, now is having sort of this rebound. So there is a little concern, I'll actually have to say, and I would love um, this BSL-3 approach to happen is we really need to know, is there a rebound of um, the virus during this late stage or can people become reinfected? I think those are two really critical issues. And yeah, you're going to have to do some infectivity assays. Yeah, I mean, that's what they have to do. I mean, they really have to, you know, do the um, do the plaque assays, uh, do mm-hmm. the viral culture, do all the confirmatory stuff, because with just the PCR, we, we don't know. And, and this is critical yeah. for us to know, because if we're really taking people that maybe go through a lull where the virus replication goes down, but then rebounds or people become reinfected, um, and then we're putting those out in what we think of as a COVID, you know, negative region, yeah. um, you know, or sending them back to the nursing homes, that also is a potential disaster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we thought like, oh, we're doing a better job now. So we need to know. So yes. Uh, hmm. uh, the other thing, um, and this is this is the ugly, this is what really I found upsetting. And we're still trying to get a handle on um, a couple late stage things. People went home, they were doing better, 
Some people never even got sick enough to come in the hospital. And now I'm uh, treating a, a large number of people with bacteremia. This is where bacteria is in the blood. Mm-hmm. And I think I mentioned the first time I saw this, we're like, oh, maybe it's the steroids, maybe it's the immune modulators. And no, we're seeing people that never even came to the hospital, received no therapy at all. And now we're seeing quite a bit of E. coli bacteremia, Staph aureus bacteremia. Um, so mm. really, really um, a bit of an issue. I mean, we we saw an increased incidence, I think an eightfold in increased incidence of staph aureus pneumonias after influenza, uh, but not necessarily the bacteremia. Um, So this is a concerning issue. Um, And some of these bacteremias have been um, fatal. Um, So fatal and non-fatal bacteremias at about week three or four. So these people have a consistent story. Some of them were never PCR positive, but they have a nice um, IgG um, serology test Hmm. that um, gives us the connection along with the the story. Some people actually were in the hospital, um, had a PCR positive, and now here they are three to four weeks later. So um, we'll need to add this to our stages of the disease. Uh, the next, and um, this is going to be interesting to see how true this is, um, but the issue with the potential linkage to second trimester miscarriages. Hmm. Um, and so there was actually a, a paper. It was a little bit back in JAMA, and I sort of watched it and I'm waiting to see the how this pans out. But, um, you know, thrombotic issues, um, you know, they say viral detection, the placenta, but again, it's PCR. Uh, hmm. We're still seeing the pediatric multi-inflammatory syndrome, um, and I've been in touch quite a bit with the pediatricians trying to come up with um, protocols for what we're going to do going into the fall for um, – dealing um, with, you know, in fact, pediatricians are great. They, they see the kids no matter what. Somehow our pediatricians had an incredibly low rate of, um, of getting infected with COVID-19, like lower than the population average. So, hmm. um, but the pediatric multi-inflammatory syndrome, just to keep it on everyone's radar, um, these, these kids tend to have um, fever, Um, The median age is about 10, right? So we've seen it very young. We've seen it up to 20. A little bit more than half of them get this skin rash and the swelling of the the lymph nodes in their neck. Um, They can actually end up, most of them end up with um, conjunctivitis. So the, the, um, you know, the red eyes, the red and cracked lips in most of them, about a third of them are feeling kind of mentally not not so there, a little fuzzy. Only about a third, right? So a minority of them have any respiratory symptoms, um, but most of them have the nausea, the diarrhea, the abdominal pain, um, and the majority of them have some sort of um, heart involvement. So some sort of left ventricular dysfunction, if you look. Uh, so, And you said sort of, last time this was pretty rare, right? You know, I think that is to be reinforced. It's still rare. Um, mm-hmm. These are small numbers, um, you know, at our local um, uh, pediatric hospital, Cohen's out here, you know, 40, 50 kids, which is mm-hmm. several times higher than we would see normally of people having um, these vasculitides. Um, but, yeah, still fortunately um, a minority um, relative to the large number of cases we've seen. Mm-hmm. It looks like response to therapy is pretty good in the limited series that we're seeing so far, right? Yeah, and that's that's fortunate. The The acute response to therapy looks really good. And so um, these people are getting the pooled IVIG, um, which people claim they don't quite understand how that works. And yeah, it is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but also steroids, um, and they they tend to do both. In, in classic Kawasaki's, there's usually a distinction and um, the Kobayashi criteria for all our Star Trek thing for sort of trying to determine who will require steroids or not. Um, but here, it looks like most people are just treating them with IVIG and steroids. Um, and as yeah, as you say, Chuck, these are good good responses in general. So important uh, to make the diagnosis so that they'd have access to the therapies. Yeah, and that is that is key, and that's why there's been um, all these alerts going out, you know, so that the it, the diagnosis is made, these people are treated, and then they can do well. You don't treat these people, and then um, we're worried about long term impacts. Um, an update on the virus and the serology testing. Um, you know, more bad news about the serology testing. Uh, CDC basically came out with a blanket statement about half of the test results you're getting you can't trust. 
Um, and that's a bit of an issue. Um, you know, we noticed, I think I pointed out at the healthcare system out here that, um, you know, they're able to report to the board, we did great. So few of our employees got infected and that a few of us were like, well, yeah, but how come so many people were PCR positive and out of work? Um, so it was, you know, issues with sensitivity. And actually now this CDC has put on their website a whole little chart trying to um, educate us about positive predictive values, which, um, you know, uh, good luck to them. I don't think that's going to succeed. <laughs> People seem <laughs> seem to find it very challenging. Like, okay, I already got sensitivity and specificity, and that took a lot of brain power. Now you've got positive predictive uh, values based upon prevalence. Um, but it is it's a bit of a challenge. I mean, they point out that even if you have a test and they use a they use a you know test which is sensitivity ninety percent, specificity ninety five percent, and they say. If the disease has a prevalence of 2%, your positive predictive value is only 27%. Hmm. Um, so what, what they're actually trying to do here is introduce, I think, the concept of orthogonal testing. Um, and I don't know how familiar a lot of our um, listeners are to that. Um, but orthogonal is, um, you know, ortho meaning in a line. So you do one test. And then you repeat the test and you're using the results of the two tests. So if you if you have two positive tests, now your predictive value is up in the high 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's part of and also the negative predictive value is going to improve. And so that's part of our um, before we send someone out. So someone has been ill. They've been PCR positive. They've had covid. Um, what we like to do before we send them out of a covid area is to negative tests a little more than 24 hours apart. Um, so that's our orthogonal testing. Add that to our list of things. Um, the other that's thing in testing, I know that this was brought up, the issue about what happens to those oral tests and what about those tests at home? Um, mm -hmm. So there is the Robert mm -hmm. Wood Johnson test that's right. FDA approved, the saliva test. Um, and there's a bunch of people that are, that are hoping to be able to use this to um, part of the open up phase. Um, and there's also a few at-home tests that are now, um, you can actually go online, you know, this moment, you can click a few things, you can go to Everly Well, you can go to letsgetcheck.com, um, you can actually go through and, um, you know, for about $100, you can get a test sent to your home. And these are, um, these are swab tests, so those are nary swabs, these are not um, oral tests, but um, trying to improve access to testing, because that continues to be a challenge. And you mail these back in? Is that how it works? You do. You do. So you, you go online. They send it to you. You can get it, you know, normal mail or overnight. Um, you go through, collect your sample, and mm -hmm. then um, it gets sent back out. Yeah. What's the turnaround? Do you know? Um, I do not. I do mm -hmm. not. You know, they, they claim you can pay extra and within... 48 hours of the lab receiving your sample, you'll get it. So mm -hmm. you could sort of say overnight to you, you do your test, overnight back, 48 hours. So about four days, um, you know, if everything goes as promised. Right. Last week, Dixon said he went into a CVS and had a saliva test, which they're doing uh, for you there. You can do that as well. He said he was negative. <laughs> <laughs> this was Dixon, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Are you still negative, Daniel? I am still negative. Zero negative, right? S zero negative. And I'm actually, you know, I've tested a couple different, you know, I, a part of I test it just to test the process to make sure this is really working. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get tested again. <laughs> so I mm -hmm. keep testing. <laughs> um, but we do, we do warn people, don't use those tests to, uh, you know, tell people they're immune. Um, you know, so I was on the phone just yesterday. It was with it was a family where um, the the daughter was positive, the son was positive, the father was positive, and the mother was negative. And you know, I was like, you know, it was very awkward because I had to explain that she just didn't love her children. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, see, you never even know with these serology tests. Um, and yeah, and we also, since we don't know about reinfection potential, there's, mm. they're, they're right now out in the gray zone and, and we'll eventually figure out what to do with the results. Mm. Um, and the last, just so I don't drag on for too long here, just, just an update on management from door to door. We're still, you know, we're still using the risk stratification um, when people come in um, where we look at the lymphocyte um, and neutrophil. So the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio uh, we still look at um, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations, um, 
procalcitonin, ferritin, C-reactive protein, and D-dimer. Um, we're still seeing that same pattern where the first week is this viral, the second week is when we see um, the potential surge. Um, we've started to use a little bit of remdesivir, and then we ran out of it. Um, <laughs> there's limited supplies. Um, but at least we feel like we have a little bit of direction on the tiny impact it has. And it looks like the population that we'll try to target is the the patients who are requiring oxygen, but not very much. So not the people that are on ventilators, not the people that are on um, high flow, but um, it looks like there's a tiny little benefit. You know, we say it's like um, spitting in the spitting in the ocean, you know, you're not going to mm. move your chair back, but um, you know, at least there might be some benefit that we do there. Mm -hmm. um, there was, there was a study on hydroxychloroquine and macrolides. So hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And I think finally, this is going to put to rest. Um, a lot of the hospital systems created these COVID order sets, which as people remember, I was sort of pulling my hair out. Now I have none. Um, I didn't have much to begin with, um, <laughs> but people would come in and you could kind of go click, 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 click. You get your three liters of intravenous vitamin C or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And then I would try to stop them and we'd end up with some issues. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I think we've really said um, that, mm -hmm. you know, we're not clear that there's a benefit here. There may be even association with increased mortality given late. Um, but the nicest thing I liked about that paper, it was a paper in Lancet, um, you really got things broken down and you saw that there's a benefit to being female. You saw the association with certain um, ethnicities. Um, we're starting to get some sense of who's at higher risk here for poor outcomes. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, that's going to be about it. Chuck, any thoughts? No, I'm looking forward to some of the randomized control studies. These observational studies are very important. Um, but I think that until you have the randomization from the recovery study, or even some of the studies that you're involved with, Daniel, you know, the final answer will need to wait. Yeah, it is tough, I have to say, right? Um, you know, I feel like early on, everyone was desperate, like, you know, every night, like, what did we learn today? Um, and I, I worry that the quality of the data is not the quality of the data we really want uh, mm -hmm. when we're making decisions about how to manage people. All right, we have a couple of quick questions from listeners. Uh, we have one from Will, who's an electrical engineer from England. He says, Daniel Griffin recently commented it might be good to be sufficient in vitamin D at the beginning of illness, but deficient later on. This made me wonder about drugs like leflunamide or methotrexate, which people take for rheumatoid arthritis. The immunosuppressant nature of these drugs has led people to be, to be cautioned that they're at extra risk from COVID-19. However, might it turn out to be the case that such drugs actually reduce the risk of second week complications and thereby reduce the overall risk? Might it be they're actually a low-risk group rather than a high-risk group? And he wants to know if you have an opinion and whether you've ever treated people who are existing users of these drugs. Um, so, yes. Uh, yes, I have an opinion. I have always plenty of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, y you know, the the first thing I'll say is I'm sort of hoping, you know, when we see stuff like that big um, study about um, the these observational trials where it looks like people who got treatment did worse than people that you just stood back from. Um, I, I always hope that we learn our lesson that, you know, do no harm, sort of stand back. And, you know, when I saw the vitamin D, of course, my, you know, my worry is that people are going to start overdosing on vitamin D because, you know, the news cycle, like, you know, all the people that started like buying Pepsi and, you know, everything else um, that they thought mm. might somehow make them better. So I'm hoping that there's um, a little bit of sanity here uh, that, yeah, it's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be studied, but please don't run out and take a lot of vitamin D. Uh, we did early on, there was this idea that, oh, maybe people with rheumatoid arthritis who are on Plaquenil, people who are on methotrexate, people on different therapies, trying to get a sense of, did they do better? Or did they do worse? Um, and, um, one of the discussions we actually had today, which I thought was an interesting discussion was about, um, people who, um, got tocilizumab or steroids and the issue that you're giving something that calms down the immune system, but it lasts for a month or two. Um, mm -hmm. So ideally, when we start coming up with ways to modulate that um, cytokine storm, which I think we've uh, been characterizing, um, we want something that just lasts very briefly and then we can turn right back off. Methotrexate is not necessarily something um, that 
is able to be turned off so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Mona is w wants to know about proning. Uh, her husband was a Navy corpsman during the Vietnam War, and she said he before that he worked at a Marine Corps base hospital, and they treated those with pneumonia or other respiratory problems by turning them onto their bellies and turning them 90 degrees and hanging their lower bodies off the sides of the beds. And then uh, she listened when you were talking about proning, and uh, Rich asked the idea where proning came from. Um, and he, she asks, I wonder whether, uh, why isn't, hasn't this been used from the onset? You know, we've known about proning for 50-plus years. And, um, and she also wonders whether doctors in countries with less money would use proning routinely. You know, they don't have ventilators. Yeah. Yeah. So these are these are excellent questions. And proning um, has been around for for decades. Right. I think 30, 40 years people have been um, doing this. And this was something that was sort of discovered. And part of the reason I think it was discovered is because you can get such quick feedback. Um, mm -hmm. And early on. Right. We, we got advice from China on how to manage um a lot of things. And, you know, I'm not sure how much of it worked out. Um, you know, in one of the early bits of advice was early intubation. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to mm -hmm. wait, you want to get these people intubated early. And I think most of us feel like that was not helpful advice and, and maybe bad advice. Uh, because when we started um, waiting, we started realizing these people may become hypoxic. But um, even though they met criteria, once you put them on a ventilator, the outcomes were, were awful. Uh, very high mortality. And so we we started basically doing other things, saying maybe not all this advice is gospel. And so um, hmm. the proning, um, yeah, the proning was part of our saying, like, let's actually try things that were not in these recommendations that we initially got. And um, I think it was in March that was actually one of the first publications I saw out of Wuhan. Um, and it was just a small series. It was about nine people where they did proning in the context of um, COVID-19 and saw, you know, a, a clinically significant improvement in the oxygenation status. So um, we very quickly jumped on. I think, um, you know, if you go back through the TWIV episodes, it was – um, early on, it was the I think the Irish patient, right? That we, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, who unfortunately I, I should point out is now back in the hospital with bacteremia, mm -hmm. um, just as mentioned, um, sort of a late stage complication. But he's he's doing all right, by the way. Um, but yeah, not as all right as if he'd stayed out of the hospital. Uh, but um, yeah, we we very quickly, and it was one of those things that you could do with with rapid feedback. Uh, but yeah, I think that this is interesting. Um, uh, we tried to jump in pretty quick. I think as soon as we started saying, like, hmm, we may want to come up with our own approaches and not just follow the guidance that came out of China. Um, and I think this has actually gotten widespread use. Hmm. Uh, Bryn writes, and this is pretty funny, let me be honest about my layperson status and even admit that I took meteorology and oceanography in college to avoid the hard sciences. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question about... Um, deciding to send his children back to school in the fall. My husband and I worry about our son, who had apnea at birth, uh, requiring a NICU stay, chronic bronchitis that turned to pneumonia twice, uh, reactive airway disease. Should parents with kids who already have lung issues be more worried? I feel like there's precious little data on the impact on kids, even with Kawasaki-like syndrome, and many parents are trying to make big decisions without enough data. Friends whose children have asthma are just as concerned about whether or not schools will be safe. These are excellent questions, Bryn. Um, and I was just, I was on a, um, so it was sort of a web type conference. These, they have these Zoom conferences now um, for UC Santa Barbara, and I'm going to actually do a presentation for William and Mary. And I get asked um, to weigh in on um, issues like this. And I always try to just you know, focus on the stuff that I can comment intelligently about. So, um, the, the, the science of it, the clinical aspects of COVID, because you know, a lot of these decisions are sort of beyond that. Um, mm. fortunately the biggest predictor of good or bad outcome in COVID-19 is H. Um, and you can really see that, uh, the curve starts to go up as long as you're under the age of 50, your chance of dying of COVID-19 is well under 1%. Once you get up to 80, you're up to about 15%. And when you get down to these lower ages, um, 
it is quite a bit lower. But now let's add a little bit to that. So, you know, if it's, you know, if you're going to make a decision and you, the risk of death for your child is 0.1, so like one in a thousand chance, um, and then they have um, some lung issues, we know a little bit. We could say, okay, that might raise it to 0.2, so two chances in a thousand. So there is a little bit we're starting to learn about how you can adjust that. Um, the Kawasaki type syndrome is still quite low. Uh, but again, we don't have the follow-up. So, you know, this is a later complication, one that we've only started to recognize. So, you know, the the reassurance can be that the risk of death, the risk of complications in children is still low. We've been surprised that asthma has not been a significant um, hmm. issue where COPD and being a current smoker currently was. Um, but, um, yeah. These are going to be tough decisions because I know uh, I won't even mention their name, but one of the the famous sort of TV doctors was saying, you know, well, the price of starting schools is a certain percent of children are going to need to die. And I just that paradigm doesn't work for me. I, I think that what each individual is going to have to do um, is make a decision about what are, what are their risks? What risk are they willing to take? Because we know there's we know there's harms to sheltering in place. We know there's harms to schools being closed. I, I think I described the increase increase we're seeing in drug overdoses and suicides and mental health issues. Um, so these are complicated decisions that I'm glad I'm not going to be the actual one making um, the decision. But school can be made safer, um, but there's no way we're going to be able to make things 100% safe um, for quite some time here. Last one from Steve. It was hot news last week here on the BBC that blood clots are a major problem. You guys have been talking of these for some weeks. <laughs> Yeah, it's because we have Daniel, right? <laughs> <laughs> now the hot news is T-cell count is low in severely affected patients. Is this news to you? Um, no. <laughs> I think we – this is something I think if you go way back, I tried to point out early on. Um, yeah. And this was this concept um, that we started seeing, and this was sort of helping me get a sense of who to worry about, but the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So we were seeing the neutrophils go up. And I, I think I always made the point is I always, when someone does a complete blood count and they tell me what the white blood cell level is, I'm like, would you tell me, you know, which white blood cells are up and down? I say, it's like going to a restaurant and they say we have food. Um, and so what we saw early on in COVID was the neutrophils would go up, but the lymphocytes, which are your T cells and your B cells, that these would actually go quite low. And the lymphocytes dropping is associated with clinical worsening, um, associated with worse outcomes. Um, when we see that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio get above six, we start to worry. And this is actually one of the ways that we track people. As the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio comes down, as the lymphocytes, so the T and B cells start to rise, that's associated with a, a person doing better. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I guess it was news to us two months ago. Yeah. Uh, so. hear it, you hear it first on TWIV, and then it gets <laughs> to the rest of the world, right? Yep. All right, Daniel, thank you again. Oh, pleasure as always. And Chuck, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Be well, Daniel. Hey, thank you. Good, good to connect, Chuck. All right, we have a, a few brevia to tell you about before we move on to emails. First of all, an article in The Lancet, Safety, Tolerability, and Immunogenicity of a Recombinant Adenovirus Type 5 Vectored COVID-19 Vaccine, a Dose Escalation Open Label Non-Randomized First in Human Trial. I actually put this here because of Kathy. I thought she would like it. Mm -hmm. Adenovirus <laughs> Type 5, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, is this this is not fully gutted? I guess, right, Kathy? Right. It's just something like E three and E four and E one taken out, and then they put in the transgene. Correct. I I I don't know the details of this vector. I'll it's like more it. or less. I think it's the gonna be it's gonna be E one deleted. They they all for sure. The the ones that I'm familiar with are usually E one deleted and E three inactivated. So they um, this they put the spike like a protein gene in this. This is out of Wuhan, and they did a phase one, basically. So it's gone through preclinical work, and they have some healthy adults between 18 and 60 years of age. They got one of three doses, five times 10 to the 10th, one times 10 to the 11th, and 1.5 times 10 to the 11th viral particles. 
okay, particles actually. How would you quantify particles, Kathy, by? You purify the virus on a cesium gradient, you pull the yeah. band, you measure the OD, and there's a conversion factor. Yeah, uh. extinction coefficient. Good, cool. It's It works. The old way works. <laughs> <laughs> I just told my lab that in lab meeting yesterday. Same exact thing. And I think, didn't they originally get those conversion factors with the electron microscopy? Mm-hmm. Is that the? I believe so. Yeah. Where you yeah, mix you it, you mix with a known a known quantity yeah. of little beads, yeah. and then you count your little viruses and beads right. on a field. And that's right. Oh, we can tell we're all old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but see, nowadays they would say, "Where's the kit that I can buy that's to right. do that?" <laughs> I once uh, worked the on app? the Philips 100 microscope. Yeah, it's an old one, Very but old. it's not the one by um, the German guy. What was his name? Zeiss. No, no. The first EM made uh, in 1939. I remember. No. I just said his name today in my lecture. That's, huh. uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, anyway, they get this intramuscularly. And the primary outcome, of course, for this phase one is adverse events in the seven days. And they went out to 28 days. They also look for antibodies by ELISA, neutralizing antibodies by looking for neutralization of infectious virus. Uh, and uh, they also looked at T-cell responses. How about that? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be relatively safe. Um, you know, arm soreness, fever, headache, muscle pain, fatigue. I don't know. Some of these things you have anyway. I mean, that sounds <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, you know, no severe reactions. Um, and they made, these people made... Uh, ELISA detectable antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and they say T cells as well. And that's all we know from this, which but that's good. It's safe. It seems to be inducing an immune response. And we'll move on to phase two, maybe phase two slash three combined, who knows? Yeah, I but I understand that they don't have enough cases in China now to test vaccines there. Is that correct? Right. I that, think that's right. I I'd heard that. I'm sort of surprised that I oh, I think I just found it. Um they don't have a ton of information about pre-existing antibodies to the ad5 mm -hmm. vector here. Um, that's usually the problem I hear with these. Uh, and so the fact that it worked really well um, and it looks like some of them at least had pre-existing immunity is really good. Actually, uh, if you, uh, they do address this. Okay. okay? And there I'm were a might be in the appendix. Uh, there were a significant number of people with, uh, pre-existing ad5 immunity and they did not do as well in terms of their uh, uh immune response uh to the antigen as did the others okay so there is evidence in this study that pre-existing immunity to the ad5 vector uh compromises its effectiveness yeah i think i'm, I'm coming across that now i guess i didn't make it to appendix appendices 8 through 12 earlier and this but <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this ad five vector is um, kind of the standard platform for the company Ken Sino Biologics that is um, that is behind this. So TWIV members, if you went to get your shot in the fall and they said, "Well, we have here ad five or chimp adno," which would you take? Chimp, 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 chimp. <laughs> chimp. <laughs> Good answer. That is my I'm, answer. I'm holding out. I'm holding out for the messenger RNA one. Yeah, but in my case in particular, because I worked with Ad5 for, what, four years? <laughs> oh, or oh, or yes, I yes. could move to New Zealand, which doesn't have any cases right now. If they would let you. If they would let me. Yeah. So I heard from Kathy that the whole population of the world could fit on New Zealand. Yes. If it were the same that. density as New York City, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. As, I is told that my wife specifically that Manhattan or New York City in general? I think it's Manhattan. Manhattan. I, I can't think remember. It's just Manhattan. I thought it was Manhattan. Yeah, the, the density of Manhattan I, I, is used as a standard. So, that'd be a heck of a subway it, system. I, I told Doris that, and she said, yeah, but they have mountains in New Zealand. <laughs> but that's not the point. It's not the point. <laughs> Gosh, some people are lit, some people are literal, right? Probably, <laughs> probably literal. Mean you could put them in Texas, right? Well, you could probably <laughs> put, if you got mountains, they're kind of like... Um, you know, you could put more people because you got more actual more, more area, more yeah, surface right, area. It's wrinkled, that's right? You can plant well, the more. The point people. of Manhattan is that they're they're tall buildings all stuffed oh, next true. to each other. Everybody's right? stacked up. Uh, by the way, the electron microscope was invented by Ernst, Ruska. Ernst, Ernst, R Ruska and Max that's Knoll. It. Right, Ruska that's and it. Knoll. Well, speaking of RNA vaccines, uh, I just this morning saw a, a, a preprint of another one from another company. 
with a you know different proprietary lipid formulation, went into non-human primates and uh, induced neutralizing antibodies, and so that's going to go into a phase one too. So there will be at least two, if not more. Love that, love that. So you you want that one? Has anybody been um, tracking the recovered? people from COVID-19 with regards to the epitopes that their antibodies recognize. Well, you should listen to today's TWIV with John Udell and Brianne Bark. Mm -hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> so actually, no, not epitopes, but T-cell epitopes, but you're probably more interested in, in antibodies. Yeah, that's right. I was interested in the antigens that they um, recognized. Well, you know, there are a couple of monoclonals. I think, Brianne, there are like three different monoclonal neutralization sites? Is that um, correct? There are three that people have done uh, some work on. Yes. I think yeah. that there, you know, there might be more, but there are three that people have characterized. All right. Another paper uh, that came out this week worth a mention, hydrox, this is in uh, Lancet also, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without a macrolide for treatment of COVID-19, a multinational registry analysis. So what that means is they got information from 671 hospitals in six continents, a lot of people, 96,032 patients. And? And these are hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And they, these are people that were treated with uh, chloroquine and various other things or not. So they had people that got chloroquine, chloroquine with a macrolide, hydroxychloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine with a macrolide. And then they had control patients. And then they looked at all these data. And uh, after looking at all of this, basically hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine had no benefit but made people sicker. Well, it was, associ yeah, it was associated with decreased survival. Yes, and increased ris risk of ventricular arrhythmias. Right, which I would which I would say is sicker, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's <laughs> not good. And that's a known risk for these drugs. Not not the COVID sicker, but didn't help them with COVID and uh, made these issues. So, yeah, <clears throat> that's the uh, wonder drug there. And a macrolide is the one that we've been hearing about in this context was uh, azithromycin. Right. So Daniel Griffin has a couple of, his organization has a couple of uh, well-controlled and well-designed trials still ongoing for this. So I wonder what's going to happen there, right? Anybody want to take any bets? <laughs> yeah. I, I probably would, the same I, thing. Yeah, probably the same I, no, thing. No, what I mean is whether they're going to Oh, whether they're going to continue them. it. Oh. Yeah, in he's, fact, he's, in light of this, I think giving, uh, uh, you know, giving people this drug is dicey. What I, what I also yeah. can't understand is our, our illustrious president, who was taking this as a preventative, has stopped taking it, according to him. So yeah. is he now, again, susceptible to the infection because it's not preventing it any longer because he's not taking it? Well, it was probably not. Shouldn't we not use logic in this or not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's uh, ludicrous, isn't it? Logic? Yeah. What's that? Another little um, brevia here. New England Journal of Medicine. This is the study that uh, NIH coordinated that we heard about a few weeks ago. Now they finally published it. Remdesivir for treatment of COVID-19. So these are the data for the trial that they had uh, that had been stopped by the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. And this is a real clinical trial. This is not just throw some drugs at the patients and, and tell stories about it. This is a double-blind, randomized, yeah. placebo-controlled trial. Yeah, 1,000 patients in different hospitals, which is good. As Daniel says, you know, it controls for variation right. from center to center. And so these are, because as it's preliminary report, but at least it's data. Uh, so the people uh, who were treated, 538 with remdesivir, 521 to placebo. The ones with remdesivir had a median recovery time of 11 days as compared to 15 days for placebo. And the estimates of mortality by 14 days, 7%, 7.1% remdesivir, 11.9% with placebo. So they say it is superior to placebo in shortening time to recovery. Now, 
I just want to point out that this is an intravenously administered drug, so it's not for everyone. Right. Uh, and you have to be in the hospital, and so it probably will save some lives, I suppose. But as Daniel said uh, yesterday, um, we ran out of it. Really? Hmm. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Yeah. And I think the uh, – in- uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The inclusion criteria for this was that you were at a point where you were requiring oxygen therapy. So uh, these uh, patients are pretty far along in their disease. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're hospitalized and and they're well, probably a lot of the folks who end up hospitalized need oxygen. But there's these these people are sick. OK. And one more from me. Well, for for now, anyway, I'll come back. I just pasted this in, so I, I understand if no one looked at it, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, this is an MMWR that just came out today. Evidence for limited early spread of COVID-19 within the U.S. January to February 2020. I wrote this here as ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is the um, first U.S. cases of non-travel related, which were confirmed February 26th and 28th, and they have data from four different lines of evidence. Syndromic surveillance, which means you're sick and you get tested, virus surveillance, phylogenetic analysis, and retrospectively identified cases uh, suggest that limited U.S. community transmission likely began in late January or early February after a single importation from China followed by multiple importations from Europe. Until late February, this incidence was too low to be detected by emergency emergency department syndromic surveillance. Bringing us back to the early days when we were still going to work, I guess, yeah. until mm-hmm. January. Yeah, we were still going February, to work. February. Where, uh, where did that first uh, case from China land? It was Washington. It was from Wuhan. Someone, a traveler, remember that uh, one guy? He went, Washington came from Wuhan. State? State. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you say Washington, it means Washington State. Right. As Mark Chrislip likes to point out, you don't need to say Washington State <laughs> because Washington, D.C. is different. <laughs> but nobody does that. <laughs> they don't. Oh, they don't. Sorry, Rich. I'm sorry, Rich. I don't. I I, listen, spend, yeah. listen, I'm bulletproof, dude. Hey. You can't. <laughs> you are. Yeah. You just can't hurt me. You have to be if you live in Texas. There's no question about that. <laughs> well, he hasn't lived there that long. No, he, right? you become bulletproof and then you move to Texas. <laughs> no, he got bulletproof in Buffalo, New York. Man. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. All right. Okay, Kathy, tell us about your repurposing study. Oh, um, so this is a study that's just been announced. Are, are published in BioArchive. It's a multi-department, multi-school study at the University of Michigan. I'm trying desperately to get back to the Google Doc. There we are. And uh, so they have this whole program to take drugs that are already approved and test them. And so they did this in the BSL-3, which is right around the corner from my lab on our floor, and uh, have couple candidates, including lactoferrin. So I haven't looked at the paper in detail yet. Well, so the, the, what is one of the things that's new to me in this is the technique. Okay. Which yeah. has yeah. to do with, in, if I understand it correctly, infecting cells in culture and then, uh, looking at them microscopically with a, bunch of different fluorescent probes as well uh, for uh, real subtleties in what we uh, usually call cytopathic effect. That is, does the virus make the cells look different? And this looks at it in extraordinary detail uh, and with a lot of uh, computer analysis of the images and that kind of stuff. I'm not sure what it all you know, how it all translates to effectiveness of drugs outside of this particular experimental protocol. But the experimental protocol itself, I find fascinating. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a technique that's um, been used in the drug industry for a few years and <clears throat> um, sometimes called high content screening, uh, where the idea is instead of some very simple assay that gives you a, a readout in your screening program, you have you have this system that collects a whole lot of data about your cells, and then you analyze those data with various um, computer techniques and and algorithms, 
and look for much more subtle effects than you could otherwise see in simpler mm-hmm. assays. And so that's exactly mm-hmm. what's going on. And the idea here is to take already approved drugs um, because obviously those we know can be used in humans and we know they can be produced and all the things that uh, are a lot of the things that cause failure of drugs in, in clinical trials have already been done. Um, and there's this the um, uh, there's a there's a library of like 1400 compounds that everybody uses. They're all, it's the, it's the set of approved drugs basically. And you throw them at your assay. Um, So this is a a technique that is well, this is, this is well-known strategy and good to see that they're doing it. Um, It'll be interesting to see what comes out of it because I mean, this is a, this is a bio archive preprint obviously. And we'll see, I guess, as they proceed with this and, and refine it, um, what they come up with that looks good. So what drug, uh, what, what disease does lactoferrin treat? Lactoferrin is actually a, a protein that's made by the host um, that's yeah. involved in immune responses. So it's in saliva and tears and nasal secretions. So it's a naturally like occurring that. product rather than it's a It's a naturally drug, occurring product. Um, it's, it looks like you can also sort of take it as a vitamin. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, to me, that's really interesting is, is what exactly lactoferrin would be doing. Um, right. I mean, that was my, I, I don't think of it as something that, um, I think of with viral infection. I think of it more in terms of sort of iron piracy and bacterial infection. Interesting paper in science. Why do some COVID-19 patients infect many others? Whereas most don't spread the virus at all. And this is very interesting that uh, they, they talk first about the choir practice that we talked about before. <laughs> right. You're listening, uh, They sang, snacked on cookies and oranges and sang some more. <laughs> 53. Uh, it's a super spreading event, they call it, and there have been a few others. And so these have been analyzed. They've also been analyzed previously for SARS-CoV-1. And now we have a new uh, a new letter to talk about. We have R0, you know, and... Now we have the dispersion factor K. Wow. In addition to R, the reproduction index. And K it des- describes how much a disease clusters. The lower the K, the more transmission comes from a small number of people. And the original SARS, uh, in a 2005 paper, they estimated the K of that virus was 0.16. A lot of super spreaders for that virus. The K for MERS is 0.25. Uh, in 1918, flu pandemic was one, less less of a role for clusters. And so now we have estimates for K of SARS-CoV-2. It seems to be, um, so Adam Kucharski uh, has estimated it is uh, around 0.1, and he says about 10% of the cases lead to 80% of the spread. Wow. That's actually the, the, the sentence that stuck out for me yeah. there. That's quite interesting. Adam, by the way, was on TWIV a long time ago while we were in Glasgow. Hmm. Um, So that's the K factor. It describes that. So if you could identify those 10% of people, you could make big inroads into transmission. Well, and it may not just be the 10% of people. It may be the situations. Yes. So there's so um, and the the news article <laughs> right. on this that science very very nice write up by Kai Kupferschmidt in Science um, goes into some of the other related studies and the one finding that infection indoors is um, 19 times more mm-hmm. frequent than outdoors. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and talks a good bit about meat packing plants and how people are are shoulder to shoulder in refrigerated rooms and that may have something to do with it and. Um, and then choir practice, of course, projecting all those droplets out of mouths and that kind of thing. Um, so the, the situation may matter uh, as well as the particular individual and mm. where their stage yeah. of disease is. Yeah. It took, quiet speaking, they think, is not going to be as much involved as forceful speaking and singing and so forth. They also mentioned some they, behavior, like having many social contacts or not washing your yeah. hands. And then uh, the timing, as mentioned. Right. What What I like about it is this article points out that 
In its report about the CORA, CDC left out a seeding map that could show who brought the virus to the practice. This is because of privacy concerns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like where it talks about sort of the, the issues with this in terms of privacy concerns and what types of events people remember. Right. Uh, one thing they point out here, which I think is really interesting, and I've always wondered about this this whole, this K factor could explain some puzzling aspects, including why the virus did not take off around the world sooner mm. after it emerged in China and why some very early cases elsewhere, such as one in France late December, failed to ignite an outbreak. If the K is really 0.1, then most chains of infection die out by themselves, and it needs the virus needs to be reintroduced at least four times to have an even chance of establishing itself. And he says, if the Chinese epidemic was a big fire that sent sparks around the world, most of the sparks fizzled out. I always wondered about that. Why did it take so yeah. long for it to spread? So this may be part of it, yeah. It's quite interesting. And the original article by by um, Kucharski uh, is a link to, it's in Welcome Open Research, um, if you would like to see how the numbers are calculated. And I just warn you, there are lots of formulas. <laughs> the interesting in thing this about this paper, if this is the right one, uh, yes, at the, in the title it says, uh, peer review, colon, one approved, one approved with, with reservations. reservations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had never seen that before. Estimating the overdispersion in COVID-19 transmission using outbreak sizes outside China. And uh, this is a, this is an example of how you make models, I guess. So a lot of uh, sociology is is put into predicting what would happen if. And I think if you look at the countries like Italy and uh, South Korea, <clears throat> where you have a lot of large extended families, I think that's a, a, a tell a tell that you might expect this to be a, a larger problem than it would be in some place like uh, New Zealand, for instance, or Iceland. Okay, and finally, Kathy, you have a science paper, commentary. Okay, or uh, yeah, this one, as I said, uh, it doesn't really give much news, but it came out and seemed to be kind of splashy. I, I got it in several feeds, um, mostly uh, talking about, um, again, uh, transmission aerosols versus droplets and so forth. And the thing that I that resonated with me is that they – uh, mention the thing that we've said where if you could smell the cigarette smoke, that would be a clue. And because the size of the particles of the cigarette smoke would be the size of something of an aerosol, the smaller size. And so that's uh, a way to think about that. I can't find my highlighted version, but that was the main take home message for me. So this is interesting about the cigarette smoke because when I talked with Mark Dennison a long time ago, right, he said he went to work that morning and he smelled cigarette smoke and the guy was way down the block, mm-hmm. right? And he said, that can't be, it can't go that far. It's too, that's, an aerosol, that's an aerosol. So I didn't Drosten estimate, Kathy, 45% aerosol, 45% droplet? Mm-hmm. That's what we've been told. Yeah. I don't know where that comes from. I looked at the references in this paper. They they say there's evidence for droplet transmission, and I agree in super spreaders it, it is. And, you know, I looked at the papers, and none of them have actually direct evidence. They're just all inferred. So, I mean, I don't know that we, we can prove it except in the case of uh, super spreaders. Well, and the super spreader events that we have don't pr- – they all are consistent with droplet transmission. Um, you know, the, the choir practice, the meat packing plants, the, um, these sorts of situations, you have people close together for extended periods of time, in many cases, speaking forcefully or doing other things that, that would produce a lot of droplets. Um, we don't have a good example of the, you know, the person walking into a room for 15 minutes and walking out and everybody's infected, which is, that's what you see for something like measles or, or a a virus that's really airborne. Here's something you'll like here, Alan. Um, So they say aerosol transmission must be acknowledged as a key factor. Evidence suggests that COVID-2 is silently spreading in aerosols exhaled by highly contagious infected individuals with no symptoms. Owing to their small size, aerosols may lead to higher severity Mm. because virus-containing aerosols penetrate more deeply into the lungs. That's going way out on a limb, I think. 
<laughs> I agree. <That's, laughs> that the evidence does not show any such thing. There are a lot of experiments that need to be done based on yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> this, this paper, I, I was actually pretty annoyed with a lot of the um, the claims made here versus the evidence that they're trying to cite. Um, yeah. And the discussion of masks is similarly fast and loose where they, they say, well, you know, countries uh, that implemented masking had much lower rates. And well, but there was a whole lot else going on in South Korea and Taiwan. Yeah, uh, testing. And, <laughs> yeah, the testing, the testing and the isolation and the and the, um, you know, the tracing of contacts that went on was rigorous in those countries. And I think that's a much bigger story. And I think we have much clearer evidence that that's working than a few paper masks. I'm not saying masks. I, nobody's proven masks don't work, but I am just not sold on those as being a big part of the story compared to testing, tracing and isolation. Of course, as you read this article, you are surrounded by advertisements for masks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. And and I know it's not science's fault because they buy a package, blah, blah, blah. But really. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> All right. That's it for our brevia. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, why don't you take our first email? Right. This was sent to me uh, by a friend from graduate school. In Tweet of 617, Sir Joshua Reynolds was quoted from a poster in Vincent's office. I hadn't previously <laughs> heard that one. I thought I'd add two more of my personal favorites on the topic of thought. The great enemy of truth is often is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And that was from John F. Kennedy. And... Mm. Um, Beth said, I actually once used that in a scientific review article on the topic of genetically modified organisms. <laughs> <laughs> and blow is one that comes to mind given the current political climate in many places about the shutdown, new mask requirements, opening churches, etc. All the phony First Amendment rights protesters. And this is from uh, Soren Kierkegaard. People demand freedom of speech as a compensation for the freedom of thought, which they seldom use. <laughs> ah, that's great. Yeah. So... That's yeah. great. That's that's that one is a lot like uh, Joshua Reynolds. Yeah. So I, I, this one. is starting to be an arc. I think we have a couple more during the show, <laughs> and I know that uh, Vincent, when you posted your poster picture on Twitter, uh, people started adding their famous quotes. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah, you you had suggested I put up a picture, so yeah. I did. Kat. That's good. Um, I came in on Tuesday and took a picture of it. Well, I didn't actually. I had someone take a picture. Uh, Dixon, <laughs> yes. Dixon, can you Carl. take... Uh, Carl, Carl yeah. writes, great show. Helps to remind us that smart people are a blessing to society. Question, I sterilize my phone, mask, and keys when I come back from shopping in my little Chinese UVC box. Why can't stores and other businesses help with the reopening risk by deploying UV light or ozone during off hours? Because he can't afford it. Wait, he sh <laughs> he sterilizes with his little yeah, yeah, UV yeah, box, yeah. right? Yes, not Wait, he doesn't go shopping no. in the little UV box. No, <laughs> <laughs> tell them that's the, the way he wrote it. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to spend it, right? They don't yeah, that's they're going out well, of business. They're eh, there. There are some. There are multiple issues here. There's the cost of it, but the um, there's also the safety aspect. Mm. When somebody accidentally hits the UVC light while a bunch of shoppers are in the store. Um, and then the the bigger thing is the efficacy problem. You know, you blast the store with some UVC light overnight, um, so you degrade all the plastic on your shelves, by the way. But right. um, <laughs> you come in in the morning, you shut that off, you've got some safety mechanism, and then you let all the shoppers in, and they bring all their germs in, and you undo your sterilization in 30 seconds. Exactly. I, I There's a lot of... See yeah, I was going to say there's a lot of UV shadow. I mean, there's yeah, places there's, there's that aren't even going to get shadow. There's a lot of um, yeah. I, I just don't see this as really accomplishing much. Um, you know, I and just as a general thing about this and the masks and these other simple solutions that um, they they don't necessarily they're not necessarily bad ideas, but. The problem is everybody wants some simple thing that will allow us to go back to our normal lives. Oh, if we all just wear masks, we can reopen everything. No, 
that's that's not going to do it. These little strips of cloth you have over your face are not going to prevent spreading the virus at a, at a enough efficacy to reopen everything. Uh, UVC light, same thing. You know, it's got it's got issues that are going to prevent it from having the level of efficacy that we need. Simple solutions seldom are. I think uh, yes. uh, just to add on, I think the ozone thing is just impractical. Flooding a yes. store with ozone and then clearing well, it out. It just damage a lot of not a practical yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah. I think that all of these things could damage the products in the store too. That might be another yes. reason they don't really want to do it. Yeah. Rich, can you take the next one? Jeffrey writes, here's another. Oh, this really got me. Here's another quote about what we know and what we do not know from Donald Rumsfeld. Now, I have a strong reaction to Donald Rumsfeld, but (laughs) the quote stands nevertheless. I mean, he was not a stupid individual. Quote, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things that we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I actually like that. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, is. it really is. It is good. You know, when he said it, people were critical, but in retrospect, it's actually quite yeah. good. Yes. Yeah. And Jeff is a paramedic here in New York City. That's right. Thank you very much for your work. Yes. Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Thalia writes. Thalia? Thalia. 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 Um, She writes, uh, and she's given us the pronunciation of her name. That's why I was trying to make sure I did it correctly. Um, I have a question about cross immunity. I'm not even sure this is an actual word in English, but I'm translating it from the German word. Kreutzimmunität. <laughs> um, on his Kreutzimmunität. Uh, okay. Um, on his podcast last week, Christian Drosten gave an in-depth account of the strange confluence of factors that led to the 2009 H1N1 outbreak being much less severe than it could have been. He said that according to animal studies that had been conducted on the 2009 swine flu, it had the potential to be quite severe in humans. However, due to cross immunity from previous H1N1 viruses, there were two age groups that had some pre-existing immunity to the 2009 virus. Do you think something similar might be going on with SARS-CoV-2, that there might be multiple sources of pre-existing immunity? Um, and then she uh, also points out that her name is Thalia, with the TH pronounced like the word the. And it's a Greek name. Thalia is one of the nine Greek muses. Um, so I think about this uh, as cross-reactive immunity. Um, and I think that it's possible. We, we don't have great um, studies to know whether there is Uh, full cross-reactive immunity. We haven't really seen a lot of antibody responses, but um, I think that if we had some way to go back and figure out who had never been infected with any coronavirus in the past, we might perhaps see something about differences in um, their response to this virus compared to um, some of the others. And uh, there was a recent paper um, looking at some aspects of cross reactivity in T cell responses um, that made it look like there was some cross reactivity there. Right. We discussed that in what is it, episode 619 in some, in some talk- detail. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and Stanley Perlman, of course, talked about antibody cross reactivity between seasonal coronas and SARS CoV 2, and he said there was likely none. I have. But maybe T T cell could be different, exactly. right? I haven't yeah. seen any evidence of antibody cross reactivity, but um, there certainly could be some for T cells. And I don't know that we have a great way to look for people who have absolutely no um, pre existing immunity to make those comparisons. Mm. I want to take issue a bit with the H one N one business. Okay, I remember these animal studies. They were done in ferrets. And the ferrets got really sick, and the news made a big deal of it. And I said, ferrets are not people. (laughs) So I think that's part of it, that it's not just the immune response or the cross-reactivity, cross-protection, cross-dressing, whatever you (laughs) want to call it. 
There is a cross dressing. There right? is. There is. Uh, Jonathan Udell was I talking it. about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, here's the story. 1918 uh, flu pandemic was an H1N1 virus. At the same time it went into people, it went into pigs. And it remained in pigs from 1918 to 2009, remains there today. And it doesn't evolve much in pigs because they don't live very long. <laughs> and so there's not a lot of selection, you know, not a lot of antibody selection. So it's called, you know, antigenically static pretty much. And so that 2009 H1N1 got the H gene from pigs, from pig influenza viruses. And so if you lived around 1918, you had some immunity uh, to the virus. But I think after 1957, it, it nobody who would, who would live then were, were protected at all since the against the 2009 H1N1. So you had to be quite old at the time to have some, like Dixon's yeah. age, to have some protection. <laughs> and that's simply because, it's not because of cross-reactive epitopes, it's simply because the virus uh, that w was in pigs and didn't change much over all those years came back into, into people. Now, at the same time, the H1N1 in people remained from 1918 to 1957, where it then finally changed to H2N2. But by then, the 1956 vintage of H1N1 was very different. And so if you, you, know, you were born in 1950 and got infected with H1N1, you weren't protected against 2009. So that's what I think is going on. With all deference to Christian, das coronavirus. <laughs> all right, that leaves me now. Right? And, and Thalia, by the way, was the muse of comedy. Wow. Ah. Ah. And she Ooh, also good. was the excellent uh, person who made the podcast about Twiv. Yes, right. And I, I just, I just had to look up which muse that was because I, I was a, one of the people who was mispronouncing Thalia's name last time. Well, the German way to pronounce it would be Talia. So it, that's right. Yeah understandable talia or thalia she pronounces it thalia which is the greek thalia way. but right. talia the way we were mispronouncing it is a german way where you say th is t yeah okay so she wants to have her name pronounced like greek right yes yep. okay beware of greeks bearing gifts <laughs> All right, Diane writes, you and your co-hosts have made it clear that the virus behind COVID-19 appears to be from the wild, although I share this belief. It's not a belief. As well as discussed in the currently circulating conspiracy theories, not all those who entertain the idea that the virus could have come from a Chinese university laboratory believe that it was man-made or man-modified or being studied for malicious intent. Indeed, some imagine a wild virus being studied at the University of Wuhan for legitimate scientific purposes, could have accidentally leaped to humans due to poor practices when handling wild animals or the virus tissue obtained from them, which we have addressed that it is not, it didn't come out of the laboratory because of a variety of reasons. First of all, that nobody was known to be working with this virus. Uh, and they, the laboratory says it didn't come from them. And all the genomic data tell us it's a recombinant virus uh, with bits and pieces all over the place. Right. So and, the, uh, there's nothing right. There's nothing exactly like it out there that would that would do that. Right. Yeah. What you would, what you would have to hypothesize in order to buy into this theory that they were working with this. Okay. So let's agree that it's a wild virus. It's not man made. Um, you would have to assume that somebody at the Wuhan lab had isolated this wild virus, um, brought it into the lab and was working with it, studying it, had not for some reason put it into their database because the lab maintains a database of viruses from which, in fact, they pulled the RATG13 sequence that is most closely related to this. Um, so they, for some reason, they, they brought in this virus, didn't put it in their database, but were working with it anyway and doing so with poor uh, handling practices and it got out and then they this had to be multiple people retroactively covered up the fact that they'd been working on it this is preposterous so if you that you could that you could have that many scientists keep the biggest secret in the world for this long it's that is not what's happening and to take the simplest part of her question could it have happened due to poor practices when handling wild animals okay and maybe it wasn't even studied cataloged or whatever but it was just 
bad handling when you're out there in the wild. If you want to see a picture that's worth a thousand words, Google John Towner, J-O-N Towner. You can uh, uh, Google it with Marburg virus or a cave and you'll get either a picture of him working out in the wild with a bat fully in a pretty much close to a BSL-3 uh, PPE suit and out standing outside of a cave. The same kind of thing. So they're using extremely careful precautions when they're doing this kind of work. And so you can't imagine that it's uh, cool where mm. they are. So they are really suffering. No. The, uh, yeah. And meanwhile, the bats are coming out every night and flying all over the place. Okay. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And and so yes, actually, um, we come finally to a point of agreement. Could this be due to poor practices of handling animals in the wild? Yes, absolutely. But probably, I, I'm certain this was not poor practices of animal handling in the wild by anybody with a clue about coronaviruses. Right. It wasn't sort of so this, bad practice by researchers who were working on this. Right. So it's still, I, I mean, yeah, you could have somebody who uh, traps bats for a living or, or collects bat guano, um, highly likely uh, that there's not a lot of uh, safety practice in something like that. And that person could have had poor animal you know, sanitation habits in, in dealing with it just because they didn't have the proper equipment. Uh, but that's, yeah, don't, that's not coming Don't up. farmers collect it? Don't farmers collect guano sure. for fertilizer? Sure. Um, they don't I, use biosafety. No, I think that's I think that's done with a shovel. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's, uh, that is the one point where I would say, okay, yes, poor practices handling animals in the wild, that's a known route where you get a virus like this into humans, but it's something that any scientist who works on these goes to extreme precautions to prevent. And as Kathy just pointed out, you know, this example, um, gowning up to go into a cave that probably people go into all the time without gowning up, but the scientists take a much more serious approach to it. Kathy, perfect timing. Kevin writes, dear TWIV team, after your insightful discussions about singing in the past few episodes, I thought you might be interested in hearing about a SARS-CoV-2 cluster detected in Germany near Frankfurt. A religious service where the attendees were singing without face masks has been found to be at the center of a cluster of 107 confirmed cases. The organizers claim to have complied with the required social distancing regulations, but unfortunately did not, didn't <laughs> listen to TWIV. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Cheers, Kevin, where it's, uh, he's from uh, Zurich, where it's, sunny and 20 degrees Celsius. And he gives a link to an article in German and one in English. And he said in the, he, he couldn't find any English articles that mentioned singing. And in fact, I couldn't see any singing in the German article mentioned. So, it, but in any case, uh, if there were, it was a church service going on, uh, it was most likely singing. So. Another mm-hmm. arc, right? Yeah. Another mm-hmm. arc, yeah. See, that's why I don't sing. It's not because I can't. It's just <laughs> right. all because of the virus <laughs> that's transmission. Good. Yes. Right. Can you can you sing, Brian? No, you can't. No, not at all. <laughs> Dixon, you're next. Anthony writes, crowd, he sends a picture of a crowd waiting to be vaccinated against smallpox at the Department of Health building in New York City, April uh, 1947. And then Vincent adds, a man with smallpox walked into New York City in 1947, so they immunized millions. From a That's single a person, picture. a small person. That is a great picture. Yeah. That's the uh, way people. you should respond. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, so the, this guy came from somewhere and he was infected. So they they immunized millions of New Yorkers. It's amazing. Instantly, wow. almost. It can be done. It yeah. can mm-hmm. be done. Yeah, yeah. And everyone wanted to be immunized. Yeah. That's right. Should I take the next one? I haven't done one yet. Yeah. I was I'm sorry, Alan. Alan. I left yeah. you out again. Oh, dear. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, Richard writes, Hey, crew, uh, you have mentioned the comet-like trail be- behind runners and cyclists and ways of going about playing tennis, but I think swimming adds a <laughs> handful of further complications I'd love for you to discuss. Public pools are often in enclosed rooms. When you're breathing, you're getting a little water in your mouth and probably spitting some of it back into the air and pool. And you're in pretty close proximity with other swimmers, even if you try to keep your distance. My question is, is it safe to use a public swimming pool? I imagine there's some chlorine in the air, but would love some peace of mind beyond the CDC saying that it's safe. Um, first of all, I just want to comment that we have indeed come to a point where we do have to second guess um, announcements made by the CDC. Uh, mm. Secondly, I would say that swimming in public pools is 
going to be kind of risky. Um, just the, this, yeah, you're, you're breathing hard if you're swimming laps and you're spitting out water and droplets and yes, there's chlorine in the water, but, um, I think this may not be a great activity to do unless you're the only person in the pool. I also think it depends where you are in the U.S. because some areas have very little infection rates, right? True. If you're mm-hmm. in Bozeman, is that a place? Bozeman, yeah. It's a real yes, it is. Yes. Very small, probably not a lot of cases. But if you're in New York City, I wouldn't go to the Y. Maybe they're not even open. Right. right. What about our Arkansas? <laughs> Arkansas? <laughs> no, no. The, do you remember the picture that they showed of people in the in the uh, lake? I believe oh, yeah. it was in the lake. The, the Ozark. They were packed like sardines. Oh. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. The lake's yes, not even chlorinated. It's not even chlorinated. So we should start it? hearing about that soon because that was a week ago. So I think the incubation period, 14 days at max. So I th- we should start seeing a blip somewhere. But, Alan, if you have a swimming pool in your backyard and it's chlorinated, you're probably okay, right? Oh, That's yeah. Right. If you are if you and your family are the only ones using the swimming pool, then you're fine. That's like you, know, you and your family are the only ones using your kitchen. Um, but... Uh, it, the, the question here about public swimming pools, I think that that's yeah. not going to be safe until we've got a clinically proven vaccine. I mentioned to Vincent that <laughs> when I heard that the Ann Arbor pools were going to be closed, my first thought was, oh, then nobody's going to get polio virus this summer either. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's <laughs> true. We're drowned. That's exactly right. Yeah. Where <laughs> my brain went, like they in the 1950s, close. swimming pool diarrhea. Yeah. They used to yeah. close swimming pools, yeah, for yeah. sure. Ah, uh, yes. So this, we, you know, we we forget history, don't we? Yeah. Well, some of us do anyway. Uh, Rich, you're next. Mary Beth writes, I received an email this week from an MD basically stating that the media is lying <laughs> about COVID. She shared uh, a uh, an internet site, and I'd like your thoughts. I feel like I have cancer just from looking at this site. I am quickly losing hope (laughs) that our species can overcome the conspiracies and survive. Hmm. And I'm not even going to mention this site, and we shouldn't post it. It is just an an abomination anti-vax site that has, uh, you know, advertises itself with a bunch of people with doctor in front of their name. And uh, it's just uh, everything in it is a lie basically. And it's disgusting. And I share your despair over this. However, you know, there have been this kind of stuff has been going on since humans learned to talk and probably before and uh, eh, nothing really changes much. We have, uh, you know, we're better able to spread the lies now, I suppose, broader and faster. But uh, it's, you know, it's always going to be there. We just have to do whatever we can as individuals to encourage people to learn to think. I just this read something uh, about um, relating how there were conspiracy theories in 1918 oh, yeah. about the flu. Mm, sure. Oh, right. mm-hmm. oh yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, and, and, you know, anti-vax has been there since Jenner. Yeah. Yes. Okay? yeah. There were there were anti-vax movements uh, against Jenner. You know, there were there were. Um, uh, people who were against pasteurization yep. of milk. Still are people first. who are against pasteurization. <laughs> yes. yeah, right. And uh, they show up in emergency rooms. This is true. Yes. <laughs> this is true. So, you know. Go figure. Or the morgue. Go figure. Uh, when I was making the show notes for Raul Rabadan this week, he was on TWIV number 30, I think. So I went mm-hmm. back to them, and there was an article claiming that the uh, H, it was in the middle of the 2009 pandemic, which we just discussed. And there was an article claiming that the virus came from a lab. Yep, sure. I mean, this is not new. I don't get it. And why would why would someone say COVID is made up? I mean, I can understand anti-vaxxers like Wakefield making money to be an anti-vaxxer. But why would you say it's made up? No, it's because they, because they desperately them. don't want the reality of what's going on. No. Yeah, it's... it's- Vincent, it and, happens all the time. You know, I get that. I don't want this either. Um, <laughs> but the solution is not to make up some alternate reality and try to live in it, because that's not going to work. Brianne, you're next. All right. Catherine writes, um, I'm a 35-year-old female with a normal BMI. 
My LDL is a little high and I smoke a pack a day and I wheeze if I breathe out real fast, but no other huge health concerns. (laughs) My boyfriend of three and a half years and I live apart, mainly for the cats. Each cat wants to be an only child. We take turns staying at each other's apartment. During the stay at home order, the sporting goods store he works for closed down. I made sure he followed all of the same precautions I did in regards to not being within six feet of another human being outdoors and not being in a building in which a human has breathed in the last few hours. Our stay at home order lifted a couple weeks ago. He has started working again and I refuse to be around him other than outdoors and several feet apart. He is exposed to customers and his coworkers. We do not know when we will get to see each other again. The only solutions I see are A, stay at home order reissued, B, vaccine. I will refuse to take one produced at warp speed. I want one that has gone through the same process any FDA approved vaccine would have had to go through before 2020 or C, tests. I have two questions. One, do you think I am being unreasonable with my precautions? And yes, I know smoking has a higher probability of long-term health effects than this, but that's a tangent that has already been well addressed. Two, when do you hypothesize reliable, maybe greater than 95% sensitivity and greater than 90% specificity, at-home rapid result testing will be available for purchase by the public? Thanks in advance. These are all good points. These are all very good points. I like Um, the vaccine points. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I I, don't really think that you're being unreasonable here. Um, I think a part of it maybe depends on, you know, different areas of the country where you're living. Um, if you were in New Jersey, where we still have quite a few cases, I would say that these precautions certainly made a lot of sense. And I don't know when those tests will be available for purchase by the public. So Daniel said last night you can already get some, but uh, not clear how accurate they are. Some you, some home kits where you swab your nares and then you send it back, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure the early ones are not going to be very sensitive and specific. Yeah, but the antibodies so. will just say if you've had it, what she really means No, this is, is not an antibody test. This is not an oh, antibody she's test talking about talking. the uh, PCR test? Or I don't know what she is talking about, actually. Detection of the virus test. Just a test. Yeah, there, okay. well, there are okay, so you have to say which test, though. Uh, for, for Catherine's, right, so for Catherine's purposes, you would actually want the RNA test, the PCR test, because yeah. right. um, she would need to know if her boyfriend has been, uh, ha- has, a, has an active infection. Um, if it turns out he's already gotten over an infection, then that's, <laughs> that shouldn't be a big deal. Um, but she wants to know if she's going to get the virus from him, so... Yeah, she'd need a reliable test over the counter that could be done on a probably a frequent basis. And I don't know. I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't expect that anytime soon. I think we, we might get a rapid we might get a good rapid test for antibodies sometime in the next few months. That's um, that's widely available. Um, I don't know about a good rapid test for PCR no, a PCR test is going to have to be sent out. So it's going to have to be shipped. going to be rapid. The only right. thing I can anticipate is that maybe someday there will be some sort of strip test for antigen. Right. Okay? But even the flu tests that exist are not home tests, right? No. No. Nope. They're not, uh, they're so, not terribly reliable either. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I would not be looking for that anytime soon. It could be never. Also, I think based on mathematical things that we've discussed or pointed to in the past, you'd want a lot higher than 95% sensitivity and a lot higher than 90% Mm -hmm. specificity. You'd want it to be as close to 100% as you could. It seems to me that if you have the ability to stay apart, you should, because if your boyfriend's working and contacting a lot of people and you have the ability to stay elsewhere, you should do that. Uh, I would. Now, now, our daughter works at Trader Joe's, and we are very concerned that she is going to carry an infection in our home, but there's not much we can do about it because she has nowhere else to live. But um, My wife works in an emergency room, and yeah, I, right. you know, I, I presume that they, this increases our risk, but we make a point of isolating ourselves from everybody else. So, 
And Daniel goes home every night. Yeah. But he's very, very careful. And sanitizes his clothes, he's yes. Really, and and right. really careful. Yeah. Right. All right. Joyce is next. Joyce, um, did I understand from your May 23th episode? I don't even know what episode that was. <laughs> <laughs> what year is this, right? <laughs> that Parkinson, all Parkinson's cases may be triggered if not directly caused by colds. Is it, did we say that? No. I don't recall saying I don't it. remember that. No. This doesn't even ring a bell. Usually it kind of rings a bell, but... I, I, I do remember something about Parkinson's, but uh, it was nothing. Uh, I'll see if I can dredge it up. Was this, that an episode? I don't know. Huh. Uh, the reason she is interested is because her grandmother was diagnosed with what they at the time called pseudo Parkinson's, and she was eight years old during the 1918 flu and showed signs of Parkinson's in her late 20s or 30s. And um, on a personal level, I was told I didn't need to worry about getting Parkinson's because the way she got it was unusual. But if it wasn't, does that mean her descendants might be at risk for the same thing happening from a different virus? Does vulnerability to viral trigger run in families? I just don't know for that particular trigger. I don't know anything about it, and it sounds like no one else here knows, right? No, I can't address it. Got me. No. Sorry, Joyce. Uh, and and then, I think uh, the 23rd episode might be 617. Uh, that was recorded last yeah, Friday. It, oh, it was uh, Friday, huh? Yeah, that was. Uh, it says it was posted May 24th, but that's the closest one. Coronavirus times. We were all there. Yeah, it was last Friday. We don't remember Parkinson's. Um, oh. Was was Daniel? Did Daniel talk about it? No, I don't I, think so. I vaguely remember something. I think in someone's letter. I'll see if I can find it in the Google Doc. Anyway, we apologize, Joyce. Uh, second question: I've only listened to a few episodes, so please forgive me if you already answered. I've heard your team casually say in the fall with regards to a second wave. However. I've never heard you say definitively that so cars is too is seasonal, and I've heard from other sources we don't know. The easiest way for me to rationalize both facts is that even if it isn't seasonal, the time required to ramp back up a wave would get us into the fall. Is that correct? If so, what are best practices for medium risk individuals during the summer? So we don't know if it will be seasonal. So, you know, the seasonal coronaviruses, yeah, they're seasonal. <laughs> That's right. The common cold coronas. This may or may not be seasonal, as Ralph Barrick has said. And seasonal means as the weather gets colder and the humidity drops, which typically happens October-ish, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on where you are. And then transmission increases. And it, that could happen. That's what we're talking about. There, there could also be something with um, people being outdoors a fair amount in the summer and in the fall. Uh, potentially inside, yeah. going back to schools or going back to places where they're going to be inside, um, which might lead to a little bit more transmission. Um, yeah. So I think maybe your a best practice might be being outside um, and being yeah. far spread from others. I, I know that when I talk about uh, in the fall, uh, I am, uh, I am indeed saying it casually. And in my mind is mostly the timing issue. Okay, that yeah, we're in yeah. a lull here, and I anticipate that there uh, that disease may uh, resurge. And I'm particularly uh, interested in what's going to happen when schools start. Okay, yes. So, I mean, you you ask what you can do over these months. Well, you have to be careful, as we have said. You know, depending on where you live, especially if you're here in New York, you really need to be careful because there are a lot of cases every day still, a lot of population density. If you can, you have to distance. You have to protect yourself, as we've been discussing. You know, I, I've been thinking several times during this discussion just to, uh, you know, give my own example uh, to as a practical example. Um, of course, I'm in a nice situation because I don't have to go anywhere being retired. Uh, but the fact is that except for a couple of trips that were actually in-store trips to – uh, target for uh, some specialized groceries and one trip to Lowe's in the last two months. That's maybe three trips in the last two months. Uh, we've done all curbside pickup and otherwise I haven't been out of the neighborhood. Okay. And I do that uh, to a large extent be to, for the sake of the mental health of my extended family. Okay. 
My daughter and her family are concerned about our health because we're older. Um, and they're also concerned about their family. They don't want us uh, dumping virus on them. And to me, it's no skin off my nose. I can live like this for a long time. Sure, there are some inconveniences. There are some things I would like to do, but I can wait. You know, it's been one year, I'm up at the top of the gel here. One year isn't much. So a small percentage of my whole uh, lifetime. I can wait. <laughs> up at the There's top plenty of the to show. do. <laughs> Rich, uh, you're saving a lot of gas money. Aren't you? Uh, yeah. And electrons. We don't even charge our electric vehicle. Yeah, the bills have gone way down. It's true. Right? It's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah and uh, uh, there have uh, been some really chill. nice. Okay. There have been some really nice um, pieces that have come out. Um, the one I'm thinking of most recently was one from the Atlantic talking about how, you know, people can also realize if they absolutely have to, um, you know, be social, they could maybe find one other family who they could spend time with and not suddenly open up to hanging out with everyone in the whole world. Um and, you know, sort of smaller things that can be really uh, important. So I think that thinking about the risk of what you're doing and ways that you can mitigate that risk with whatever you have to do are pretty important. And uh, I was going to say that was the sort of the bubble concept that we may yep. have talked about. Um, but also to point out that we are all privileged in that we can do these things Yes. Pretty yes. easily. Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. And work at home yeah, and, and stay I, at home. As, yeah. as things are, uh, um, so a couple of things that have come up in this discussion, we're, we're talking about um, how things are starting to reopen, which is maybe not necessarily a good idea. And this notion that we're, we're in sort of a lull, I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize this as a lull. Um, the, the measure for reopening stuff in most places is, case counts leveling off and coming down a little bit and not the, the virus is still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, nothing's really fundamentally changed and nothing that we no simple intervention that we can take is going to change the fact that your risk of infection is still very, very high from things like going to a restaurant. Um, and yet there's tremendous pressure to reopen the restaurants. So even relatively well-run states are talking about how do we reopen restaurants, not do we reopen them, but, you know, we're going to, okay, we're only going to let them use every other table. I don't think that's much of a solution. And, for, you know, for my own um, health and <laughs> mentally mostly, um, I do not anticipate eating in a restaurant again until we have, uh, until this is fixed, you know, which is pretty much going to mean an effective vaccine. Um, I certainly don't anticipate flying on an airliner. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I've, I've have seen stories about amusement parks reopening, which is insane. Um, but because this stuff is being done uh, out of step with the science, I think individuals are going to need to make their own decisions about what level of risk they're willing to tolerate. Yeah. What do, What do you think about sporting events, Alan? It depends on the sport and how the event's being done. I don't think spectator sports are an option for anything. Because I know there's talk of football in the fall, which, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 people, it seems to no. me... <laughs> no, that's a, no, that's a terrible, terrible idea. If you've been to any kind of a stadium, you know, you're packed in like and they're yelling it's just <laughs> and they're yelling. Exactly. And and that's going to be everybody infected and football. I mean, think about the players. They're completely up in each other's faces and that's going to be a bad idea for them. Uh, granted, they're generally young, healthy athletes, but uh, the coaches aren't necessarily mm -hmm. i mean um and uh, and it's uh that's just a bad setup i think team yeah. sports are are out i often think about the fact that in austin uh, early in march they made the call to cancel south by southwest and in ret there was a lot of hand wringing over that but in retrospect that looks prescient yes it is. Yeah, i can't mm -hmm. imagine what that would have been like or the same thing yeah. with canceling march madness mm -hmm. right no, right. and, and since nothing has fundamentally changed, we can't say, oh, the case counts have leveled off. Now we can do all those things we canceled. No. No. 
for for exactly the same reasons we had to cancel them in the first place. I, these co- these collections of people are really dangerous. I, I was on a Zoom call with a former student who lives in Lexington, Massachusetts. I said, hey, you had any cases? And he said, yeah, we had one that came from that Biogen meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's what happens. You get people together, and this is all a big problem. Uh, Mid-June is going to be really interesting, two weeks after Memorial Day weekend, because uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Memorial Day weekend, people really, apparently, from what I can see in the news, went nuts. They did. You know? Yep. And uh, so it'll be uh, really interesting to see what happens. On that. I cut the grass. <laughs> <laughs> on, on March 12th, I had the news come on my phone. I took a screenshot of it. Do, uh, t- news top stories, COVID-19 updates, NCAA cancels March Madness, MLB and NHL postpone their seasons, Broadway goes dark, and Disneyland will close. I took a picture of that. Just It seems so yeah. – it was like everything at once, and that yeah. was March 12th. I, I agree that those of us who can stay home we're lucky and yes, but but I also uh, respect people who have to go to work, that, right? Absolutely, they don't have mm-hmm. choice. Of but course. I think the, the things we've been talking about, you know, restaurants and these sorts of events, you don't have to do that. And I'm not, as Alan said, I'm not traveling. I'm not doing it. I'm I'm going to come here twice a week, but we have to have very specific ways of doing that. You know, we have to wear masks as we're coming in and so forth so yeah there's and, a and whole, have so I'm, many people in a lab i'm frankly gutted about this you know i really want to go to the gym mm-hmm. I've, I've got i can work out at home i can run around the block but i i want to go to the gym and work out and i want to i really want to get back to flying mm-hmm. you know but i'm not getting into an airplane with somebody not in my household uh, just <laughs> just fly by yourself yeah but the problem is uh for insurance purposes at the flight school i can't rent a plane if i haven't flown with them in the past 90 days Mm -hmm. Uh, i see and so they in fact i just got uh the flight school closed you know immediately when all this started happening and they just sent out an email to everybody saying um we are we're gonna restart renting only for solo flight um Mm -hmm. for for our established customers uh, and i think they started that this week and I looked at my calendar when my last flight was, and like probably most of their customers, I can't do it because I don't meet their insurance requirements of having flown with them in the last 90 days. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, interesting. interesting. You know, and, they, and they're going to be hurting for that, I'm sure, but uh, I, yeah. that's just not going to be an option for a while. So I, actually, this brings up, I wanted to ask a question. I know we had some pilots listening to us earlier, and I'm just wondering, you guys are sitting home, you guys and gals are sitting home. Now, if it's when it's time to fly again in the future, you're probably a little rusty, right? Do you have to be <laughs> there's re, a, right? Do you so have I can, to do something. I can shed some light on this. There's a um, so the, in addition to the insurance requirements of the flight school, I'm tracking other things of mine that are expiring. Um, as it happens, I I was due to get my medical exam, uh, my FAA medical exam in March, and I did right at the beginning of March. Um, and in fact, I talked to the medical examiner uh, who, who was doing it. And he said, so what do you think of this whole COVID-19 thing? <laughs> um, and uh, so my medical's current for the next two years because I only need a third class medical. Um, commercial pilots uh, who need a first class medical, depending on how old you are, that often lasts only six months. Mm. So they would need to get their medical. Um then there's a whole there's a whole raft of FAA requirements for recency of flight and experience mm-hmm. and different I operations do. and and so that all is going to expire and for airline pilots it's more stringent and they have to have had recurrent training regularly so yeah. there's there will be an entire retraining process that all the airline pilots and professional pilots uh, and you know amateur pilots like me are going to have to go through if they're even going to be flying again, because it's not clear at what level the airlines are going to be operating post pandemic. Uh, I just want to point out that Joyce is a member of a totally different niche nerd community, the font design yes. world. Very cool. So actually I, I love font. So I wrote to her and we geeked out over <laughs> fonts a little bit. More. And I said, you know, I, I have changed my font every year in my, my virology lectures. You, you should watch them. And she said, no, I'm not a visual person, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> she likes to listen. So I said, and she sent me a, a, one of her fonts that she worked on or something. And I said, okay, if I use this in next year's lectures, you promise to watch <laughs> them. She said, okay. Good. <laughs> 
Kathy, you're next. Sheldon writes, hello, Twib crew. Having read about the CanSino vaccine results, why has the AD5 virus been used rather than one that people are less likely to have immunity to, such as the AD26 virus, or going further to gorilla adenoviruses? The people involved certainly know of issues with AD5, so why was this used? Could it be difficulty in using other strains or non-human strains in growing them? And what do you think of the oral, parentheses, pill vaccines being developed? So I think for everybody that's jumped into making a vaccine, it's what they have familiarity with and what they have in their lab. And I would guess that the CanSino folks have built their enterprise on the AD5 virus backbone and haven't made the switch to AD26 or gorilla or chimpanzee or something like this. And also probably what they own patents around. Right. I, I think there are some differences in immunogenicity um, from some of the different ad vectors, um, but I don't recall. Uh, it's been a while since I was enmeshed in hearing a lot of those talks, uh, which strains besides ad five have good Im- immunogenicity to know if ad six, is, ad 26 is one of them. And the only thing I know uh, that you might be referring to with respect to the oral pill vaccines being developed relates to the AD4 and AD7 vaccine that's given to military recruits. And that is given orally in a pill form and has uh, efficacy. And um, So I'm searching the uh, uh, landscape Mm -hmm. document describing the the, uh, vaccines that are being researched from the World Health Organization. If I search that for oral... I get uh, a non-replicating viral vectored vaccine that's uh, oral, described as oral, and that's an AD5 uh, with the S protein on it. Yeah, I guess that would be an AD5 S protein delivered orally. I get another one that just describes itself as oral vaccine platform, another one that's an E. coli-based protein expression system of S and N proteins, another one that's an uh, orally delivered heat stable uh, spike protein subunit. That's it. So there are several under development. I don't know anything about them except that they exist. Okay, they're in, they're being worked on. Very good. Now, perhaps Rich, you should summarize the next three emails yeah. for us. <laughs> so uh, I uh, a couple of episodes ago, we got into a discussion of the term upstaging as it applies to theater. And I won't repeat what I said (laughs) about what upstaging means, but we got here three peer reviews, um, all of which are in unanimous agreement that I got it backwards. I at least got the stage directions right. Uh, But um, let me pick out, we we have uh, emails from John, from David, and from Aaron, and I'll just uh, pick one of them. I have to Uh, say... uh I feel a little guilty because when you were saying it, I, I thought it was backwards, but then I thought maybe I was listening backwards, and so. Oh, but I, I was I, speaking I, so authoritatively. <laughs> yes, you were. Right? <laughs> just, you know. Yeah. My wife uh, often complains yeah, that tell I tell me about that. Yeah. Get the same <laughs> right. news you here. authoritatively right. say something right. that's wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, yeah, this goes beyond this. I want to comment on that. I'm just going to read one of these, uh, so we get it correct uh, from David. Um, uh, oh, this is actually interesting. Uh, uh, I, ex- uh, Condit explained that the vernacular use of upstage in a way that suggested it was caused by one actor coming between another actor and the audience. My ears perked up because I knew the truth was much more subtle and nefarious. It isn't that one actor blocks another actor from the audience's view. That would be much too obvious. Upstaging is a sly way of manipulating another actor to turn his back on the audience. When two actors are engaged in a dialogue, one actor needs to move upstage towards the back of the stage uh, by a few steps, and the other actor is forced to turn upstage to address him. This puts the audience's primary focus on the upstage actor because the downstage actor's head is turned, thus making the upstage actor appear more important. So I had it. I had the stage directions correct, but I had the uh, concept of upstaging uh, um, 
wrong, hmm. uh, backwards. Okay. And, Got it. uh, I, you know, I appreciate the, uh, uh, corrections from Aaron and John as well, but for the, in the interest of time, I won't read those. However, I do want to comment that here on TWIV and in my life in general, when we're wrong, we say so. Yes. And I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> and I really appreciate being corrected. It's much more subtle than I thought. Uh, and it's very interesting. What does this saying mean? Good thing your daughter doesn't listen to Twitter. Oh, God. <laughs> it was really That's embarrassing. Right. And I say, should. Dad. Yeah. Dad. I, I probably should know this. I was just making assumptions I, uh, uh, based on the stage directions. And and as Alan points out, I was, I was stating this all in a, you know, as if I really knew what was going on. <laughs> yeah. When you it did, clearly you did. <laughs> I was, I thought I was, but I was clueless. I hate it when people do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this all came out of the chorus uh, episode, I think, where yeah. I asked you what's stage left and right, yeah. what's right, upstage. Right, because I was blah, blah, complaining blah. about the stylized diagram of the chorus. Yeah. Uh huh. All right, thanks, folks. Uh, Dixon, can you read the uh, marks, please? You there, Dixon? Nope, he's left. Yes, yes, yes. Dixon. My wife just walked in. Why are you I'm futzing? fussing around because my wife just walked in. Asked me if she wanted me to forget about it. She's going to the store. Yeah. <laughs> TMI. Right. So you want me to read Mark's? So Mark yeah. writes, he writes a haiku for today's episode. Dear grumpy twivers, we social distance Vinny and the gang do too to stop the Rona. <laughs> Wonderful. I like haikus. Yeah, I do too. Mm-hmm. Quick. Send in your haiku. Excellent. Sure. Rona. I like it. Mark is an old. Well, my students call it. Mark is an old friend of the show who has actually been here in studio. Oh, did I get to meet him? Yeah, I think you did. Oh, good. We used to. You used to come here. Remember? I did used to go there. <laughs> That's right. I think Alan is next. Sure. Uh, Christian writes, hi, Twivs. Once again, thank you so much for providing us with facts in an era of poppycock. (laughs) That's a good word. I like it. Um, Could you please give the answer of the almost Shakespearean question, to mask (laughs) or not to mask? Apparently, Taiwan and South Korea have kept the numbers of infected extremely low by using them. But here in Denmark, the authorities still claim that there is no evidence of the benefit of using them. What's the truth? Uh, Well, Taiwan and South Korea kept numbers uh, low, not by using masks, but while using masks. And masks may have had some bit to do with that. But as we've said, the story's a lot deeper. Um, The authorities in Denmark are technically correct that the evidence of benefit of using masks is not great. Um, Or it's inconsistent anyway. Uh, so I don't think I have a truth for you. And by the way, when we're talking about masks, I think it's important to point out that uh, we're talking about the ones people can actually get, not the N95 or N99 or proper respirators that are issued to some medical personnel, um, but the little strips of cloth that people are putting over their faces and often forgetting to cover their nose and just covering their mouth. I don't know how many times I've seen that. Um or the little paper mm-hmm. surgical masks. So that's what the question is about. Are How, how, how effective are those? Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, there's some evidence that they are effective in preventing an infected person from spreading the infection to uninfected people. Right. There's less evidence saying that they are protecting people from getting the infection. Um. But for me, it's pretty simple because they, you know, here in Massachusetts, they have an executive order in place that says you have to wear a mask when you go into a place where you can't social distance, like the grocery store. And so when I'm going to the grocery store or I was amused to have to do this the other day, the bank uh, to go into the ATM machine, I put a bandana over my face. So, yes, I look like a wild, wild west bandit walking around but this is i'm covering my face and it's a couple of layers of cloth um it was simple to improvise and easy to comply with and there's not really any downside to doing it and there may be some slight benefit i would say mask man 
Yeah. <laughs> mask. Yeah. <laughs> And Vincent I, I, has I mask. <laughs> yeah, Vincent has put in the link to the paper that we talked about at the top of the show, the science paper about yeah. aerosols and droplets and so forth. And the the bottom line is that masking is important. I think of it as a, a different way of thinking about um, herd immunity. That we're all doing this to protect everybody else. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and it can't hurt. It may help. Do it. They have yeah. a picture in that science article yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Kind of shows you this graphically, so you could take a look at that as well. It's open. Uh, actually, the thing the thing I find most annoying about this is uh, uh, people's sort of selfish attitude towards yes. this because this it's not about you, right? Okay, right. It's about trying to do whatever you can, however little, to help the others around you. And if there's uh, even minimal benefit, if a whole bunch of people uh, do it. That adds up, okay. And you're you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for other people. What's wrong with that? Right. You know, get real. So the interviewer at the uh, Arkansas Swim Fest last week interviewed a young kid, a male, unfortunately, who was asked why he wasn't wearing a mask, and he responded, "If my president doesn't wear a mask, I'm not going to either." Mm-hmm. That was his response. Yep. It's great. Uh, all right, I'm not going to say anything. No, um, you don't have to. <laughs> let's skip. I'm going to skip you, Rich, and go to Brienne for the next one. All right. Cool. Anonymous writes, "This is a love letter, but its writer is also a bit grumpy." <laughs> I wanted to point out a few inaccuracies in your discussion of coronavirus in Russia in TWIV 614, as well as draw your attention to a few critical nuances. First, no one in Russia is suggesting that all the COVID-19 cases have been in Moscow. It is true that Moscow, like New York City, has been the epicenter of the country's epidemic. No wonder, considering that the city likely has an actual population of 15 million people. Not quite Mumbai, but a megapolis all the same. The city government has also rolled out a broad-range testing scheme asymptomatic individuals have been able to access tests for a small fee since March, which is free for anyone showing symptoms. This no doubt has contributed to the city's case counts. Most other regions in Russia have also been affected by COVID-19, although at least officially to a lesser degree than Moscow. Access to testing could be one factor here as it varies depending on regional governance and epidemic status. Russia has a creaky system of free universal health care, which, despite its age and infirmities, has proven advantageous in a pandemic situation. Moscow's designated COVID hospitals during the worst days, approximately 6,000 officially confirmed cases per day, operated at full capacity, but still managed to accept and treat patients. Patients with non-COVID ailments are sent to designated clean hospitals. Um, and that's from Anonymous. Um, I guess uh, my understanding had been that really the difference between Moscow and some of the other parts of Russia were about testing and about sort of case counts. Um, I, I don't, I don't realize that we were talking about all of the COVID cases having been in Moscow. Well, the only thing I said was if you go to the Hopkins site. And you click on Russia, which is number three with 387,000 cases. There is one dot in Russia, and that's Moscow. Uh So there's no stratification of cases as to where they are as it happens in other countries, right? So Mm -hmm. I realize that they're not all in Moscow, but why is the map like that? And this question is not addressed here. So I'm sorry you're grumpy. Well, but, uh, I'm not really grumpy about this at all. I just want to know why you're showing it that way. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's do two more here. One is from Nick, who uh, sends the, uh, two links. I think you and your team might enjoy these two videos related to the pandemic, perhaps not as clever as the poem from around episode 601 or 2 from one of your students, but nonetheless entertaining. And so we have a spoof <laughs> so, so video. Science. About how everyone is an expert now, and then the sounds of sirens. Sound of silence, lockdown parody. We had a sound of silence uh, arc a while ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't look at these, I'm sorry. But we will put them in there for people to see. And uh, 
Yeah, and uh, Kathy, can you take the last one, please? Wait, did we skip Rich? Yeah, or we did. No? That's a co- oh, Rich, cool. Rich did the upstaging ones. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I did three in a Got three it. in a in a bat. Yeah. Okay, so I'm doing Julia, yep. who writes, Hi Twiv team. Special hello to Professor Racaniello. I was a student in his spring twenty nineteen virology course and have been a Twiv listener since around February twenty nineteen. Greetings from Philadelphia, where it is currently sixty eight Fahrenheit twenty C. During shelter in place, each time I have walked around my neighborhood, I've seen at least one dead bird on the sidewalk. Prior to the stay-at-home order, I walked around my neighborhood far more frequently and never saw any dead birds. I've considered that maybe I'm being more observant, but I'm skeptical given the extra things to think about on walks and runs, like making sure my mask doesn't fall down and trying to keep six feet from others. (laughs) Do you think this could be related to SARS-CoV-2 infection? Should we be worried about birds as a reservoir of SARS-CoV-2? Thanks in advance. P.S. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about birds to tell you which types I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a resurgence of West Nile. I was going to say, Dixon, you would like this uh, question yeah. because the crows were dying, right? That's right. And I wonder. With West Nile, and it took a smart pathologist at the zoo to say, let's That's take right. a look Tracy at Tracy McNamara, right? that's right. So is this possible? I don't know. I don't know if human coronaviruses will reproduce in, uh, in birds. I would think we would have heard something right, by right. now. And wasn't there something about whether chickens are a host for the virus? There was uh, some rumor to that effect. Yes. Whether it was in the list of or animals that were or were not, I don't mm-hmm. remember. I just remember by the way, uh, chickens. The, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection has resulted in a uh, lockdown, which has resulted in the closing of restaurants, which has resulted in a burgeoning of rat visibility. So uh, yeah. rat poison mm-hmm. comes in those sh- in various forms, and some of it is little grains of rice oh. that looks like rice, but it's not. It's a poison for the rats, but sometimes the birds mistake it. And that mm. actually happened during Ooh. the 1999 outbreak, where they were poisoning rats, but birds ingested the toxin and they died as well. And th- oh. that sort of confused the epidemiology of this because they thought that, hey, wait a minute, I thought they were dying from a virus. And now, no, no, they're not dying from a virus. They're dying for this insecticide that we put out, uh, not, or, or raticide, I should say, that we're trying to kill the rats off with. So now we have a lot of rats out there now. So maybe you're seeing the same use of this um, Interesting. Rat That's an interesting idea. That is interesting. Yep. Good idea, Dixon. I knew you would come through. <laughs> so far, I haven't gone out, so I'm going to come through, I guarantee you. Come through, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I found it. Um, cats can become infected, but dogs appear not to be vulnerable. Uh, and uh, ferrets can also become infected, but chickens and ducks are not likely to catch the virus. This was uh, something reported in Reuters, and I don't know where the primary article okay. was. There you go. Probably not. I don't know if it. It's funny that you don't know what kind of bird it is, right? Be a pigeon, right? It's, That's the most know, typical pigeon, a crow, a sparrow, a robin. Exactly. You know, those are all common ones. I don't know if there's robins. Or, yeah, there are just robins sparrows and probably a sparrow. And oh, well, you know, the sparrows in the Bronx Zoo can have malaria. Can that's true. And they can give it to penguins, right? There Dixon. You go. Yeah. That's episode six two one microbe.tv slash twiv for all the notes, including full text of the letters, questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommiers is at trickinella.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University on Twitter. She is Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And I want to report, as I have often done, we made it through about 10% of the pages of listener questions that we have. Not bad. (laughs) Rich Condit and a, um, what is Rich? Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. This is great. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.